we were doing a, a daytime recon patrol and our part our point man got it through the head that same round hit me in the shins and um scared the hell out of me my name's ron galasso and i was in the marine corps and i served in vietnam and i was an e4 corporal and i uh, I served for 18 months, got an early out to go to college. Mm. And what years did you serve? From 66 to 67. Right on. Um, talk to me about where you're from and what your childhood upbringing is like. Uh, grew up in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, my, I had an absentee dad when I, when I was like five. Uh, he couldn't bring, bring home enough money, so my mother divorced him out of financial necessity. So uh, I started throwing papers at seven, and we got caught, you know, donation clothes from the church, and and uh, we were really pretty poor. I always thought the rich kids were the ones that had store bought clothes. Mm. So uh, I became the little man of the family when I was seven, and then uh, was always gainfully employed at a young age, and uh, did the YMCA from seven to twelve through. Uh, Red Cross Life Saving and uh, was a Boy Scout and all that, but um, it was uh, it was hard because we were poor. Then at age ten, my mom married uh, a guy uh, that was a chronic alcoholic, mm. and uh, he didn't like me or my brother. And we used to get beat. He used to knock me unconscious. So uh, I ended up moving out of the house in the eleventh grade. But my best friend, who was three years older, got a job, finished high school and then enlisted in the Corps right out of high school. Wow. Wow. What, what, uh, what inspired you to go to the military? <laughs> the draft was out there, and it was a choice between the Marine Corps and the Army, and I, and, and I knew enough about the Corps to know that they're disciplined and they take a lot less casualties than the Army. Wow. So I enlisted with my best friend mm. in high school, Kip Johnson. Wow, awesome! When you went to um, when you went to go sign up, did uh, did they let you pick the job you wanted to do? No. Well, they, they <laughs> it, it was it was infantry or take the test and get aviation guaranteed. I did well on the test, but I talked to enough people that ended up O three elevens and yeah. having two tours or more in Nam. Yeah. So I I just I just went with the flow O three eleven. Wow. Um, so talk to me, what, what was it like uh, going into boot camp for you? Uh, was it a culture shock? Or... Oh, no, no. I, I, was, I was such an abused kid. And then in high school, I was always uh, on restriction. Cause my, dad, my stepdad didn't, didn't uh, like me at all. So I ran track and cross country three years. And we took Cal State, uh, Cal State, uh, uh, what's the expression for that? We took California State Finals back in those years, and I was running a 430 mile, and I was running about a 932 mile. I was fast. Wow. But that was my uh, escape from my stepfather. Mm. So the core going through boot camp was nothing. I mean, I was conditioned, and I was used to getting beat up. Yeah. And, uh, and I loved the discipline, and because I was in such good shape then, I was the guy, a couple of us were the guys that picked up the, guy, the heavier guys that were struggling, climbing the ropes or keeping up with the run. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I just love the teamwork. You know, Semper Fi means everything to me. It served me all my life. Yeah. And I got that. I got that. I came out of PFC out of boot camp, and then uh, picked up Lance and Corporal in, in Vietnam. Wow. Um, how how long from when you graduated boot camp did you end up in Vietnam? Well, it was uh, it was uh, eight week boot camp back then, and then we had. Uh, Two week break, and then we went back for uh, IRS staging training for six weeks, and then shipped over to Vietnam. That must have been July of '67, '66, mm. July of '66. Oh, so fairly quick. Yeah. Um, and so you were at 0311 Infantry at this yeah. point, right? Did you go through a? Uh, uh, well, you said IRS training. What's that? A staging training. Well, it's it's, it's the uh, at Camp Pendleton. It's it's all the the field maneuver training. Okay. And uh, rifle range. 
And um, maybe that's like for 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 me, I was O three eleven infantry as well. Uh -huh. It was S O I School of Infantry. Yeah, they changed the ah oh, so nomenclature. Yeah. Okay, they had an I R S back then. Yeah. Okay, so you get through that, um, and then you're heading off to Vietnam. Talk right. to me about that. It was scary, but uh, I went in with my friends, so we, we thought we'd be together. We were together in boot camp, same platoon, and then we went over there. We went separate ways. I, I went with uh, 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, 3rd Mar Div, and I think it was 2nd Battalion, 5th Marines, 3rd Mar Div. So we separated there, and then uh, uh, I, uh, I ended up uh, uh, through one of the... Um, the guys in, in the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, um, talking to him about, you know, what were, what were we in for as 0311s there? And uh, they, they, I, got, I was told that the Colonel, Colonel Van D. Bell, Lieutenant Colonel Van D. Bell was recruiting people for recon, battalion recon. Hmm. So I was one of the probably 40 people they interviewed and because I, was, I did well in boot camp and PFC and they're, you know, they uh, they picked me up to be part of battalion scouts. So we were like the we weren't force recon, but we were the recon for the colonel. There were twelve of us. Mm. So when we weren't running recon patrols for the colonel, because we our our staff sergeant who ran the squad reported directly to the colonel. So we didn't have a we have, we were, we had a direct line to the colonel, and he spent a lot of time with us. And when we weren't running recon patrols, we were we were flank security for the colonel on operations. Mm. Did you have to go through any specialized training? Yeah, my become... landmine warfare training and um, uh, advanced radio training, you know, and uh, learning, uh, art, calling in artillery and uh, learning uh, basic principles of recon, SMEAC, Situation, Mission, Execution, Administration. Yeah. So we, uh, we, uh, we went through about a month of school there, and then the colonel tempered us and I, I think it saved a lot of us as we went out on remember the four-wheel mules those gas mules mm -hmm. we went out with a corpsman to pick up remains of dead marines that stepped on mines and we'd bag them mm. and that conditioned us to focus on mission and not be scared and just be control your senses and, and uh, um, be part of the team and don't let fear take over and that was the best you know, orientation, it was awful, but it, at the same time, it conditioned us to be numb. Yeah. Oh, wow. I can't imagine. So you're out there picking up essentially body parts and... Yeah, uh, claymores tied to trees that were booby-trapped. I mean, it just, just a hunk of flesh here and there. We'd bag that stuff. And, uh, mm. and it also conditioned us when things would happen and we'd get ambushed or, you know... Uh, we had several situations where, you know, guys would step on bouncing Bettys, you know, around Arvin compounds and, and, uh, what's a bouncing Betty? That's a world war two mine uh -huh. that you, st you step on the, the charge it blows it up face high and blows out. Mm. And, uh, wow. and they, they use a lot of those in world war two. Uh, the V the, the Arvins got those from the U S and the Arvins put those around their compounds. Well, the, the Viet Cong would booby trap those things as well. Wow. Wow. Um, so you've got ambushed out there? Oh, we, <laughs> we, uh, our, 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 t our typical routine was to go out to a point to run a recon patrol. And then the colonel had us come back, usually a couple thousand meters away from where our, our objective was. We'd set up, uh, the four-man team at a junction of a trail to spring ambushes. <laughs> wow. Our colonel was crazy. He, uh, colonel Van D. Bell had a gold star, mm -hmm. five purple hearts from being out in the field. He didn't want any part of regiment. So he was gungy. Wow. So he asked us to not only do a recon, but to set up bushes. We were written up in stars and stripes for, you know, accomplishing our recon and tracking, you know, major movement of Viet Cong. But, uh, doing two or three KIAs, you know, ca ambushing Viet Cong yeah. on the way back. And the problem with that, with, the, with that was we'd usually run late and it'd be almost daybreak and we'd be in, in, uh, in Viet Cong territory. So we'd call out the tanks to come pick us up. Mm. 
Those areas were usually mine, so we'd jump on the tank and they'd lower the turret on the 90 millimeter gun and fire it. And I don't know if you've been around a concussion of a 90 millimeter gun, but it feels like the, I mean, it literally numbs you. It, it, it hurts. And then you can't hear for 40 seconds. Well, you go through like four or five iterations, kind of blowing the path in a minefield area. And that happened a lot. Then we did uh, rubber boat reconnaissance where they take the deuce and a half trucks and drop us off. And we go down river, uh, several thousand meters and then do our recon and then come back and sometimes the colonel would go with us and it would prolong our patrol and we get shot up coming back ambushed oh. in those boats <laughs> it was uh, it was hairy and scary yeah oh i bet um do you recall the first time you got contact in the contact in vietnam yeah yeah we were we were uh we were doing a, a daytime recon patrol and our part, our point man got it through the head. That same round hit me in the shins and um, scared the hell out of me. And I was, and I was packing the Prick 25 radio. Mm. And, you know, they, they teach you to, you know, keep moving. And uh, I was petrified because I, I saw our point man down and it was only one shot and I, and I knew I was hit. So I, I was I was uh, I was almost paralyzed with fear with that damn radio with the whip and the tail, wow. and uh, I prayed, and I got a sense of calm, and I started moving, and uh, I, I kind of said my first major contact. Wow! So the point man got taken out. Uh -huh. That same round hit me in the shin. Hit you in the shin, and you just kept you guys just kept patrolling forward. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, was it was it like a sniper or was it an ambush style? Uh, no, it was attack? a sniper. It was a sniper. Sniper. Yeah. yeah. Oh man. Whew. Um, talk to me about some uh, more missions that you went on. Is, is there any mi missions that, in Vietnam that stand out to you? Uh, yeah. uh, we we usually ran two or three recon patrols a week. We had one patrol where we had to go in an area where we knew there was. Uh, Army Rangers, so we called ahead because they were on the path to our, our, our recon uh, goal. And so we called to talk to the lieutenant to make sure he didn't, they didn't have any bushes out that would be a problem. Well, it turned out they had a, the, 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 uh, the, army, the, the Army troops out there uh, bagged their bush. They didn't go where, where they were supposed to go, and they were in line with our path to go to our mission. So uh, we got to a point and uh, fire was opened up on us and we got these brand new uh, AR-15s. We, we, uh, we were the first ones in the battalion to get the AR-15s. We had M-14s. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had them on automatic selector, right? And we, uh, we heard the brrrr, just all hell broke loose. And then and we got online and fired and we ended up killing oh, three, or th three or four of the army. Oh wow! People, and then then we got to a point where you could tell them by the fire discipline it was friendly. It was brruh, 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 and brains army, and then we we shut down. Oh. So that was hairy because of the the casualties. They 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 uh, they wounded one of our our guys through the arm, but it was a minor. But that was probably the the, the craziest thing. Wow, that was uh, wow. That's unfortunate. There's lots of incidents. I've heard lots of stories about oh. uh, incidents of friendly fire yeah. um, during combat, which is very then, unfortunate. Then the, the, probably the, the worst experience I had over there was when we weren't running recon patrols, if there was a, a major incident like a, a deuce and a half convoy that, that would run into a 500-pound five, bomb and blow the, the first truck up, we'd go out to respond to kind of stabilize things. We had a situation where there was an island uh, where there was a Arvin compound on one end and a Marine platoon on the other end of the island. Uh, it turns out that there was a second lieutenant that took over that platoon and uh, had his, uh, um, his uh, recon actually recon the whole island and part of it was going right past the Arvin compound. Well, he didn't bother to contact the Arvin commander. 
And all and around those Arvin compounds, you've got bouncing Betty mines and other mines set up around the perimeter. So that squad goes out, runs a patrol, runs right into those mines. And right away, you've got two or three KIAs and four WIAs. They did, he did that twice. He sent out a reactionary squad. Same thing again. Oh. So they end up calling, calling uh, the uh, battalion and the colonel. And the colonel dispatched us to go out. And so we ended up calling the Arvin commander to meet us, to give us a mapping of the, uh, the minefield. By the time we got there, you had, oh, it, it, it was heartbreaking. Some of the guys we knew there, their, their, their faces and heads, limbs were blown away. Still, some of them were still screaming. Oh. And uh, so we called in the, the, um, the medevac to medevac them out. But that day cost 12 lives and I think 16 WIAs. Wow. And uh, crazy stuff like that happened that was, was a heartbreak. Wow. Oh, that's unfortunate. Um, Ron, did you, I know there's a, a, a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat situations in Vietnam. Did you ever no. find yourself in any situation no. like that? No, oh. we were, because we were recon. Yeah. You avoid contact in a recon. Right, right. The closest we got, it wasn't hand-to-hand, -hand, but... Uh, when we were on operations, the colonel and the command group, we had, he, he was uh, Annunciate Sierra, that was his handle. Our handle was Annunciate Sierra, assistant. We were constant communication when we were on these, these, uh, these operations. And the, the colonel almost liked to advertise, you know, where he was, because he had, you know what an Antos is? Yes. Okay, he had two Antos. But can you explain it just in case somebody doesn't? Okay, an Antos is, is a small track vehicle with six 106 recoilers. Mm -hmm. The colonel had a pair of them. He stuck on his flanks along with us. <laughs> They're very effective, yeah. but uh, it drew it drew fire. Right. And so the colonel loved calling in the, the F4s, the Phantoms, and, and he loved to uh, have them drop Willie Peter. And if you've seen Willie Peter, those canisters, they roll, and you got this white cloud. And uh, the scary thing about it is we had, you know, we never, we never uh, uh, were affected by the Willie Peter, but you can see the damage to the Viet Cong and the villagers of that Willie, Willie Peter. That just scared the hell out of us, you know, when they <laughs> get the Phantoms dropping those canisters on both sides of it. I mean, to me, that was contact yeah. in the sense that we felt kind of helpless. Mm. But in recon, you're not supposed to have contact. The, the only contact we had was when we'd spring the bushes, and usually we had the advantage and then we wouldn't yeah. have a chance to really return fire. Mm. Um, was there ever a point, Ron, out there uh, that you thought yeah, you might not make it back home? <laughs> uh, yeah, but that condition I told you about, and my faith, um, my faith says the Lord's got uh, a day on a calendar in the future, my name's on it, and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm. And if I get scared, I'm gonna call for the Father to comfort me and help me compose to the point that I can do my job. And that, that I didn't worry about going home until my uh, 12th month, because mm. that was my mindset. Yeah. So you spent, you did uh, 12 months with your tour? No, close to 14. 14 <laughs> months. Because they were, they, were they were always shilling Da Nang, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up, I wasn't gonna take it, but I took R&R &R in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, my going into my 13th month. And I thought by the time I get back, I'd, you know, directly I'd be able to go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out that they were shelling, you know, rocketing Da Nang, so we couldn't get out anyway. Oh. So I, oh, th th this gets to another story. I, so I got back from R&R &R and I stepped out of recon and they put me in a temporary, uh, put me in a Charlie company, 1-1, uh, one -one, as a squad leader. And this, this is probably the, one of the worst things of my entire life that happened. I, I took my squad out for to set up a nighttime bush, and I, I set up my men at a junction of a trail, and I gave them their fields of fire and the location of the men, both to the left and the right. And I had this new kid. Well, I can't even remember his name now, but I set, I, I should have set him next to me, but I set him uh, one man in from the long leg of the bush. I had Gary Fontenot on uh, to my right, uh, at the junction of the trail, and then I set uh, uh, Gary Fontenot, and, and his name was Nichols. I set him in, I gave him his fields of fire, I gave him the location of Gary and the person to his left, 
we were set in no longer than five minutes and I hear a and I hear Gary scream out, oh no. He had two months left to do and he had a wife and two kids at home. And I, and, you know, and I was the squad leader. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, uh, uh, there was a gunny bag, <clears throat> a battalion that did the investigation. All my men testified for me. But uh, I, I just about went nuts with that. I went over and I started kicking Nichols. I was so upset that he took the life of, and I, and I should have known, but I should have had that kid next to me. Mm. And I'll, I'll, I'll live with that for the rest of my life. Oh, sorry to hear that. Hmm. Um, were you able to communicate uh, with family? Did you have family back home that you would write? Or was there any No, just letters and they'd send packages over, but not really. Not, yeah. No, not yeah. much, you know. Um, did you have any, what, what was your, this might be an awkward question, um, what was your favorite part about being out there? Did you have any good times? Oh, yeah. My brothers, my squad, we were closer than close. Yeah. So we'd get back to battalion and we, we, we threw the football and we'd love throwing the football and playing catch. And, uh, and uh, we were just brothers. We enjoyed everything together. And uh, we, uh, I don't think I've ever been closer to other men than I was with our battalion scout squad. They were all brothers. Mm. What else did you guys used to do on downtime? So you played football? Yeah, just uh, football and just, uh, you know, listen to music and our hooch, you know. And uh, we'd go into town. Uh, we went to the dang a couple times. And that, you know, just, most of us didn't like it. And then they had, the, uh, they had Bob Hope and Billy Graham over there when I was there. And my grandmother wrote me. Is I want you to see Billy Graham, so all the guys went to see Bob Hope. I saw Billy Graham, <laughs> oh, <laughs> and wow. I caught a lot of flack from that. But uh, <laughs> wow, um, any other stories, Ed, from your yeah, tour I, out there? Well, just just when, when we were in the hooch, or we were out, you know, playing football, or just you know, spending, spending time sharing our stories. Most of us would uh, when we debrief. After we debriefed the colonel, we'd come back and talk between ourselves because there were learned lessons. I have a a picture that's very near and dear. I have two guys on my squad, uh, David Dye and Ron Davenport. Uh, David Dye got hit by a rifle grenade uh, or coming out of a, a CAC unit, which is a combined action company thing where the, the Viet Cong got word on when we were going out to do our recon and they ambushed us. So David and I caught a rifle grenade, killed him. Ron Davenport from Ontario, a good friend of mine, uh, he was there the whole time was there and then he went for a second tour and he got strafed by a machine gun, lost his legs. Mm. And uh, he ended up dying, oh, at age 60 here, not too long ago. Oh, wow. So that picture, <laughs> And those guys were really close. I mean, we were close. Yeah. How, how, do, you, uh, how do you think they'd get intel on you guys about to do an well, uh, mission? Our Arvins, you know, we had, they had CAC units, combined action co companies, which was half Marine and half Arvin. Mm. And a lot of those Arvins would get money from the Viet Cong to give out information on when we'd be running our patrols. Oh, yeah. Because we, did, we didn't get a hundred yards from that CAC unit that we got ambushed. Yeah. And, a, and if a recon <laughs> to get ambushed means something's really wrong. Right, right. Yeah, that's uh, similar to, uh, uh, you know, in Iraq and, uh, you know, dealing with the Iraqi police and, uh, yeah. you know, the joint units like that. Right, um, right. Wow. Um, wow, so you, you've... Uh, how many friends did you have uh, lose their life out there? A lot of corpsmen. A lot of corpsmen? I mean, I, my heart bleeds. I used to work in D.C. in the computer industry, and I've never been to the wall because I have too many friends that are on the wall. And the ones that hurt the most were the Navy corpsmen. They're the ones that end up sacrificing themselves to, you know, help Marines that were down. Yeah. Those guys, uh, they're, they're legitimate heroes, oh. right? They just run into fire and treat yeah. you and yeah. uh yeah they're they're yeah. the angels of war <laughs> Amen. Amen. you know we love our corpsmen for sure yeah um 
so you do 14 months. Um, before we get into, you know, uh, when you came back from your 14-month um, uh, tour in Vietnam, uh, how long did you stay in the Marine Corps after that? Well, I had nightmares over this because they, they, they said, well, you, well, we'll give you E5 and you go back for a second tour. And I had like nine months left to do. Mm. So I applied for an early out for school. I got the early out. Nice. And it was real hard to come back to regimentation at, at Camp Pendleton after you've been, you know, in Nam for 14 months. Yeah. Really hard. Wow. And I had a, I had bought a, a 66 Chevelle a, a hot rod, and I used to get written up by the MPs driving on and off base. And it, just, it was just aggravating being, just coming back from Vietnam and having to put up with that. So I, I really wanted to get out and go back to school. Mm. Did you, um, how old were you at this time? 20. 20 years old. Uh, did you, did you, uh, we never went into you getting hit in the shin. I imagine you got treated for that. Did you, did you receive a Purple Heart for that? I had two Purple Hearts. I got one for the, 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 the wound in the shin. And then uh, it was my 10th month. We were doing a daytime patrol and I stepped on a booby trap. And thank God it wasn't a, you know, a shape charge or something to blow me up, but it turned out to be like a glass bottle filled with explosives. It blew me up and I was numb. I, th I, I closed my eyes and I was afraid to open my eyes. And I, I, I fell to the ground and I felt and I felt, could feel the blood and that scared me. And then uh, the corpsman came over and she says, uh, where are you hit? And I said, oh God, thank you. <laughs> and uh, turned out I had glass fragments all over. It didn't blind me, but uh, they, they had to pick out all the glass. And if you know, in that climate with all the humidity, it was a couple of months of, you know, picking out glass and having it scab over and then become infected and had to brush it. And so it was a couple of months from that, but I got a purple heart for that. Wow. During that phase of having to pick out all the glass, were you in the <laughs> hospital? No. No? No. You were just, that's minor. <laughs> you were just continuing <laughs> yeah, missions? Yeah, continuing Yeah. Just yeah. like, well, yeah. I'm going to pick out this glass. Here's a piece of glass on patrol. Like uh, That was month 10. And so I, wow. I uh, went another two months and then that's when I took R&R &R and I, transitioned out of battalion scouts. Okay. No one thought I thinking I was going to go home right away. Yeah. And then they put me on as as a squad leader in Charlie Company. Mm. Wow. So you transition out, um you get an early out to go to school. Mm -hmm. Did you what school did you uh get accepted to? Uh, uh, Cal, uh Cal State Northridge. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. It wasn't acceptance, but it was a I didn't have the grades to go uh, to uh uh Ivy League yeah. University, so, or, you know, USC or UCLA. So Cal State was a, a, an easy, you know, qualify to get in. Yeah. So I went there for four, almost five years. So talk to me about what transition was like for you. You're 20 years old. I mean, you've just seen uh, things that I'd imagine 99% of 20 year olds haven't seen. <laughs> um, and now you're in the mix of this college. Uh, environment. Did you go to school on campus? No, I, I was. Uh, I worked. I worked and went to school. Okay. And my dad, my real dad, had a body shop in Hollywood, and I'd work thirty hours a week at his shop, and I made really good money. And I had the GI Bill, and I was married, and I was taking fifteen units year round. I did that for five years, and because I, I wasn't living on campus, I was living at home. And I was married to my wife. Jerry Martinez, mm -hmm. and uh, we uh, never watched TV. It was just work and go to school. And, uh, and I think I got that ethic from the core that I was just driven to make the best of myself. So it was work, it was school. I didn't have time to even think about Vietnam or any of the stuff I went through. Mm -hmm. Totally focused. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, my dad, taught me the trade, so I learned uh, metal and glass and painting, and he was going blind, so I ended up running a shop for him. Mm. And then he died right about the time I graduated. He wanted me to take over the shop. He said, Dad, I didn't go to college to do this, you know, because he was a mess with arthritis and rheumatism. So when he died, we ended up selling the shop, and then uh, I started uh, looking for a job in the computer industry, and I stayed in that industry for 30 years. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Um, did there ever come a point where all the trauma that you've seen and endured in Vietnam uh, caught up to you? <laughs> I've been married four times. Wow. And uh, with Jerry, my first wife, she had an aner aneurysm when we had both graduated and she had a blood vessel burst in her brain and she was working at uh, Pierce College and they took her to uh, UCLA uh, ICU and they called me at work to say, your, Mr. Glosser, your wife's dying. So um, I had to rush over there. It turned out they, they needed me to sign a release so they could cut into her skull to evacuate the blood because it was destroying the left side of the brain. So I signed that and I ended up living in on the ninth floor intensive care unit waiting room for six weeks while she was in a coma. She finally came out. Wow. And then she came out an invalid. She, her right side was paralyzed. She lost control of being able to speak at all. So we went through five years of speech, occupational and physical therapy. Her parents were with her in, during the day when I was working in the computer industry and I'd relieve them at night. And I was working 18 hour days back then. But I, I think I attribute, I guess, my ability to deal with it to a lot of what I went through the core and the discipline and focus. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I've always been able to carry myself and others and uh, that helped me get through with it and my faith. Yeah. My faith. Um, did you ever experience uh, any like nightmares uh, or any, oh, yeah, any yeah, yeah. things? Yeah, I, I had, I was, I was having dreams up until, geez, four or five years ago. I've always been pursued. It wasn't necessarily Vietnam, mm -hmm. but being a situation where I was being hunted down mm -hmm. and I didn't either. I, I had my rifle, but no magazines or I had, you know, I had no way of defending myself and I'm constantly trying to evade this threat that's out to kill me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always Vietnam. It'd be different scenarios. Yeah. And that I had that for a long, long time. I didn't realize I had uh, PTSD from that. And then um, I think the other thing that I realized through my marriages is, is that uh, I had no patience for people who would try to take me out of my comfort zone. I had to be in control. Hmm. I didn't like to be vulnerable. Yeah. So when people would try to push me, whether it was a wife, anybody, uh, I'd get defensive and get aggressive. Hmm. Uh, and I didn't realize until later that I had uh, brain damage from Agent Orange. Wow. And a lot of that uh, brain damage, I went to uh, the Amen Clinic in Newport Beach and they did the brain scan on me. And the Agent Orange, when they show the layers, they're like map layers that you have. It shows the layers of the blood flow. And ideally the blood flow is solid mm -hmm. in your frontal lobe and the top of your head. Well, I had breaks in my blood flow on my frontal lobe and on top from the poisoning from Agent Orange. Wow. And Dr. Amen said, I don't know how the hell you got through college. I don't know how the hell you ended up having a high level job in the computer industry with all the responsibility you had. So I think my drive from the Marine Corps and my drive to overcome, compensate for that brain damage through college, through my job, um, the, the downside of that is I had no patience for people that weren't on board with me or that would surprise me with something without me being on, you know, buying into it. Mm -hmm. And that's when my PTSD would come out. And then about that time I was starting to take drugs like Rupropion to calm me down. Mm. And during that time, let's see, it was years later, it was with my current wife. Uh, she had uh, a son that has been defrauding her of millions of dollars. And we were coming back from church, probably the most embarrassing thing in my life. We were coming back from church and I was trying to get her attention about her son. She was always, you know, making excuses for her son. I said, honey, honey, I can't do this. I said, I'm, I'm so depressed. I can suck on, I, 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 I could suck on the end of my 357. Mm. Ne I'm, I'd never do that. I'd never commit suicide. I was trying to get her attention. Mm -hmm. Went home, uh, was sacking out in our den on the couch. And was woken up by two sheriffs that handcuffed me. Oh. So my wife freaked out and called them. And they threw me in the back of the squad car. And they had no... They, had no, <laughs> they were angry at me. They right. cuffed me in the back. They left me in that damn car for like 45 minutes. I couldn't breathe. I was getting claustrophobic. Mm. So I end up 
two weeks in the psych ward at Loma Linda. Oh, shoot. Where I had to go through a, you know, a lot of uh, psychiatric evaluation. And they said that, that, that the, the, the bupropion I was taking at the time was exacerbating my, my PTSD. Mm. And they changed my medication. But uh, that was probably the most embarrassing thing in my life. Then my wife, then my wife calls my brother. And that was to have my younger brother to tell him that story. And he says, well, where's the gun? I'll, I'll take the gun. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. I mean, oh, it was horrible. Oh, but, I bet. Two weeks in that, in that place. Mm -hmm. uh, oh. Lockdown. Locked doors. You can't get out. Oh, man, that's horrible. Um, when did you, earlier you were telling me, uh, you were talking to me about your stepfather. Yeah. Um, and he has an amazing story, and I, I think people would love to hear about that. When did he come into the picture? Uh, I was 11, and my brother was uh, 7. Mm. And he didn't like us from the beginning. He was slapping us around before he married my mom. <laughs> my mom married him anyway. And then it was just, you know, I didn't date once in high school. I was always getting restricted. I bought a Honda. Uh, my sophomore year, and that gave me freedom to get around, and he'd get pissed off and lock it up. So I didn't date. So my escape was cross country and track for three years, mm -hmm. just to get away. And I didn't even last the full three years with him. I had to move out in eleventh grade. I couldn't take him. Mm. I couldn't. And he beat beat my mother half to death. Mm. Came home one day from a track meet. It was around my best time in the mile. And uh, my mom was uh, came to the door and looked like a bear got a hold of her. I mean, she was bleeding, her teeth were knocked out, all that. And then so I, I sat on the front steps with aluminum baseball bat. I was going to kill the guy. When he got wow! <laughs> so it was uh, it was pretty bad. The picture that you showed me. Yes. Who would you say that was? I'll grab that. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my adopted dad. He oh, wasn't okay. my real dad, and I never really had a relationship with my real dad until I went to work for him okay. during college. But uh, we, my wife and I, adopted him. He was really neglected as a senior citizen in assisted living, so we we befriended him. And then uh, uh, I bought the Harley Davidson, and he, uh, Doc, I call him Doc. His name's uh, Roland Lucier. Um, he and I bought a sidecar in San Francisco out of Craigslist. We rode up together, kind of a father-son thing. Yeah, okay, so that's your adopt. I was getting confused. Yeah, I I, that was your stepdad. Yeah, that, no, this is, this, is, no oh, okay. this, this is my, we adopted him. So he Sorry lived with us that. for 10 years. We did the Patriot Guard thing together. I, I documented his whole life's history, and I made PowerPoint slides because it, it, it's just so remarkable. So I ended up yeah. doing presentations yeah. to cities that wanted to celebrate our heroes. So right. we did several. You can set that down. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Talk to me about him, man, because uh, that was, a, that was an, some amazing accomplishments about what uh, he's been through. What's his name? Uh, uh, Roland Lucier. Roland Lucier. Dr. Okay. Roland Lucier. He had his doctorate and he was a Navy captain. Uh -huh. So um, he went over with the Navy in 43. Uh, got captured in, in Philippines Bataan, survived the 20-mile death march, was in a hole for almost three years until the Marines rescued him. Uh, and then he went back to Walter Reed, and they were going to take his legs from being in a hole and being uh, tortured, but he talked him out of it. His father paid for him to go to MIT, so he got his electrical engineering degree, then re-enlisted uh, with the Navy in Pensacola, where they trained ship's captains and pilots. Wow. So he ended up working his way up to be a Navy captain. He was on the USS Midway. He was actually a relief captain. When captains would be rotating or they'd get in trouble, mm. they'd fly them out and fly him in on a helicopter. And he loved, he loved the job. He actually loved the job. Then he left the Navy in 57 to hire on with the LA County Sheriff's Department. He was with them 12 years. During that time, he got his, uh, his graduate and doctorate degrees in psychology and theology. Wow. Left there in 69 to become a court-appointed psychologist for the city of Long Beach, working with women coming out of the penal system. Wow. His girlfriend owned the Lafayette Hotel, and they both lived in the penthouse suite. 
she gave him the third floor to set up a wedding chapel. In the course of 15 years, he married over 2,000 Marine and Navy couples. And the Navy sent down the USS Mobile Cruiser with Captain Burke to do a ceremony in Long Beach for him, where they gave him a chaplain's jacket with crosses on it. And uh, he was so proud of that. He was actually buried in that jacket at wow. 97 here three years ago. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. How did he become your adopted father? My, my wife and I met him, uh, and he, he could barely talk. It, the problem with a lot of these, these assisted living, they neglect them. They just take the money, and they don't spend any time you know, giving them uh, have kind of communication and stimulation mental activity so he was isolated mm -hmm. and he was starting to mimic his caregivers which were <laughs> which were uh latino so he he talked like he had a, a, a you know, latino accent but he he could barely express himself mm -hmm. so we talked to some of his neighbors about his situation they all said i they couldn't understand a guy with two doctorates being in the situation he's in totally neglected so we ended up having him move in with us and we had a large home uh in South Corona at the retreat, and we had he had his own room, and then uh, I take uh, I take him out uh, to uh, do things with me like a, like he would with father and son, and then we ended up getting the motorcycle and sidecar, and then we ended up doing thirty plus missions, riding with the Patriot Guard, all the Holly Riders escorting the the hearses to the the uh, National Cemetery there in uh, in. Um, Riverside. Riverside. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That, that's got to be an amazing ride. Like, to, oh, it's fun. Uh, it's fun. It, it, it's a lot of fun. It brought, and then because he was a Navy captain, he'd be part of the color guard. And he had, he had a, uh, either in his walker or an electric chair, he'd be part of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. And he's just very proud. He'd be in this chair, but the, the color guard would be right behind him as they, they do the ceremony. Wow. And he'd love doing that. Wow. What an amazing story. Um, well, we're, uh, we're winding down, uh -huh. um, but um, you know, I always give everybody opportunity for any last words and maybe any advice that you would like to give to any veterans that maybe be struggling with transitioning um, from, you know, you know, there's a newer generation, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, I'm sure you know uh, mental health is a huge issue right now. Yeah. Suicide is a very, very yeah. big deal. Yeah. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, any advice you can give to these veterans? I, I just say, show? number one, don't give up hope. And ideally, connect with your older brothers like me, because we, we want to help. We want to be there for you. We want to share our experiences and how we overcame it. I am 100% PTSD disabled with the VA. And... Uh, uh, because I've been there, my heart's all in to help any veteran that's been through the trauma and that is, didn't have a lot of the breaks that I had that helped me get back on track. And I, I'd like to take my wisdom and my experience and impart it to them and help in any way I can. Awesome. Well, um, thanks, Ron. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, it's, uh, I can't, I can't really express this enough how honored I am to have, you know, these Vietnam vets like yourself come and sit down and open up and share their story. Mm -hmm. It's a very big deal because, uh, you know, you um, are part of the inspiration why so many other Marines became Marines. You know, us watching these Vietnam vets on TV, uh, you know, I've, uh, we always talk about, uh, yeah, how we've watched Full Metal Jacket probably a hundred times before mm -hmm. we, you know, enlisted. So, um, thank you so much. Your story is going to impact a lot of people, um, and it's a huge contribution uh, to what we're doing here at Urban Valor. So, oh, I love what you're doing with Urban Valor, and if any way I can help in the future, I'm there. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road, all on my own. I'ma be the greatest.